On today's episode of The Humankind Connection, you'll meet a bunch of people doing extraordinary things in communities across the U.S. Building homes for veterans in need, connecting incarcerated moms with their children, offering free produce to neighbors, and giving adults with intellectual disabilities valuable work experience. Welcome, I'm your host, Zuleika Nethu. Each of the organizations we're going to introduce you to today have received funding from the Gannett Foundation's A Community Thrives Initiative. It offers grants up to $100,000 to nonprofits that help improve communities, particularly those which are underserved and under-resourced. That includes veterans. One of the biggest obstacles former service members face when they return home is finding stable housing. Homes for Families builds houses and neighborhoods for veterans. Here's why the organization was awarded a Gannett Foundation grant. Okay, so here we are walking up to my front door. Darcelle Bailey has been waiting to be a homeowner for years. She just moved in with her kids. This is my living room, excuse the boxes. The road to this place has been long and hard. Darcel joined the Air Force at 18. She had no idea the uphill battle she'd face when she left. What did you find when you came back? Like, how hard was it to kind of get back into real life or try to adjust? I was just grasping at it, whatever. So once I um, discharged, I, I had a job as a receptionist. I had a job working in a laboratory. Like, they were just all varied because I just wanted to find something I could do that will provide me with enough money so we could survive. These agencies that are supposed to be here for us are quick to say no. Even when they know you deserve or need some services, you have to jump through hoops. And they get shuffled around a lot. Donna Deutschman says the lack of access is common when veterans return home. She's the CEO of Homes for Families, a nonprofit offering affordable home ownership to former service members. We recognized a deep need um, for veterans to have affordable housing. In 2020, more than 37,000 veterans experienced homelessness. Women are at a higher risk for housing instability. Approximately 1.1 million veterans are living in poverty. They're being deployed for long periods of their lives. Sometimes they lose the whole decade of their 20s. Things that we learn in our 20s are when we're able to make mistakes and it doesn't matter much, they come home without those skills. Darcel heard about Homes for Families on the radio and couldn't believe it when she found out she qualified. It just seemed unreal because I've been so told no so many times. They have earned these houses. They've made them possible through their service and that their family deserves every penny saved in acquiring these homes. Under the program, veterans are offered low-cost mortgages based on their income. The homes are also equipped with special considerations other homes might not have. They are all built with a certain amount of modifications specific to veterans. And that's very important, whether it's providing lighting that's veteran specific for both PTSD and for hearing, especially quiet homes, drawers that close quietly, lots of noise attenuation so there aren't sudden sounds that could really exacerbate PTSD. Things like open areas so that the anxiety level is very low. So far, the organization has built dozens of homes in several California communities. A $100,000 grant from the Gannett Foundation's A Community Thrives Initiative will help them construct more. We're building neighborhoods. We're not building just a house. Darcel used to live on the ground floor of an apartment building. We lived on a super busy street. We lived by the um, train track, so it would shake when the train came. We were very vulnerable. I'm a single mom of three kids, and on the first floor, anybody could have tried to come in. She used to have to get up an hour and a half early to get to work. She's a teacher for kids with disabilities. Now, it's a five-minute drive. How did you feel in that moment when you moved in? Unbelievably grateful, happy. I just wanted to make my kids proud, you know, seeing them and, and then think, oh, I want to paint my room this color, or even my younger son telling me, this kitchen is perfect, it's just, and the house is just the right size, like things like that. It, it means a lot. Homes for Families also provides veterans and their families with art therapy and workshops to help deal with the trauma of combat and separation. 
Separation from a parent can have serious repercussions for young children. Heartbound Ministries is another grant recipient. The organization has expanded its Little Readers program. Parents in prison read a children's book on camera and the video is sent to their kids. It helps build literacy and keep that parent-child bond strong. The hardest part about being away from home for Anne is missing her daughter. I just want her to always know that I love her and I'm thinking about her no matter where I am. And no matter how much distance is between us, she's always right here with me. Anne is serving time for drug-related charges. It's been several months since she's seen her 10-year-old, but she connects with her through reading. The Little Readers program records incarcerated parents reading to their little ones. Why don't we all go, my mom says. We can take the flying coach. Oh, I want a flying coach. In 2018, Heartbound Ministries was one of 16 A Community Thrives grant recipients. The $50,000 grant has allowed Heartbound to continue connecting incarcerated parents to their children through reading. The kids get a DVD of story time and the same book so they can read along. Moms like Anne can pick out a shirt to wear for the occasion so kids don't have to see mom in her inmate uniform. Anne is thankful that she has a way to stay connected to her family. It definitely shows me that people still care. I've made mistakes. I haven't always done the right thing. But I'm still forgivable, and I still matter, and I guess that's what that teaches me. And it's Mommy, and I'm going to read you Umi Zumi Car's Big Race. While Kara serves time for drug-related charges, she reads to her son. It's pretty hard when you're away from your child for 10 months or more and they're small like that. Getting a relationship with him, getting a bonding relationship, it's very helpful. Her six-year-old watches mom's DVD over and over again. He said, Mommy, I saw you, you read the little book to me. He was like, I got a book too, just like you. And I was like, yes, baby, you do. And you know, he was just so excited about it. My mama said that um, he's watched the video one after another, you know, time and time again. It helps both of us. It helps me to allow him to see that I'm okay and to read to him, but it helps him to see that I'm okay, that I'm alive and well. I talk to him on the phone very rarely. A little boy doesn't want to talk on the phone. Reading lets moms bridge the distance between them and their child and helps them bond with their kids who miss them very much. It rebuilds my faith in humanity, really, um, to think that people put aside their time to help me have, you know, a bond with my daughter. It's just amazing. Little Readers has reached thousands of children since it began in 2014. Imagine hand-picked raspberries, fresh garlic, and leafy greens ready for your next salad. All of that is on offer at Kula Urban Farm in New Jersey for free. It's operated by Interfaith Neighbors, which received $100,000 from a community thrives to expand their farm. Take a look. It's harvest time, right in the middle of the city. Produce at this urban farm is headed for sale to local restaurants. For people in the community, anything they want, from garlic to raspberries, is all free. This Urban Farm is in a low-income area in which we like to facilitate growth of certain plants that people can come and pick. They call it the Farm Without Borders. Neighbors can pick their own vegetables and herbs to garnish their next meal at no cost. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. No limits, no barriers. There's really no fence, no gate, nothing. And people can walk right in there. Maybe a volunteer like Matt or somebody else, a worker might be, be there or not. We have had no vandalism 
whatsoever. Farming runs in Matthias van Osterhout's family. He grew up in the Netherlands. He studied plant biology in university and wanted to start a project that wouldn't just give back to the community, but empower its members too. Let's just say it took some trial and error. Not everyone grew up on the farm or uh, uh, had a garden. So, well, of course, sometimes we do see people uh, pulling out the whole plants, for instance, yeah. where the way we harvest, we just snap off one leaf uh, and then let the plant grow. So he hired both volunteers and workers looking for a foothold in a tough job market. They help harvest and educate people who come to the garden. In fact, since the farm opened about six years ago, it's been an education for everyone. We had a hard start because uh, when we first started this, we were growing uh, lettuce and uh, kale, uh, what you see behind us. Uh, but a lot of people uh, from the neighborhood are more from the southern states or from, from the Caribbean. So now we're growing collard greens. But that's what getting to know each other is all about. Mattia says they used to only grow big red heirloom tomatoes, but now also grow green ones for another delicacy popular among residents, fried green tomatoes. We had to learn it was a, it was a little curve, but uh, now people are so thankful. The nonprofit enterprise stays viable by selling produce from this hydroponic greenhouse to the public and to trendy restaurants around the U.S. Over here is where we grow our microgreens, which are very popular with our area restaurants. The group also holds farm-to-table dinners outside to pay for the Farm Without Borders. Now, a $100,000 grant from the Gannett Foundation's A Community Thrives initiative will help expand the outdoor space for larger events. We're uh, planning on uh, purchasing the lot next door and then building this uh, pavilion, uh, which will be like a three-season place. The farm doesn't just offer produce to residents in need, but also to local pantries year-round. It's one way for families on a limited budget to eat fresh. And workers say there's no reason it can't be done elsewhere. We think this is a great template for cities and uh, towns around the U.S. Uh, to get behind and to really uh, start doing sustainable farming for, uh, for your community as well. And they have big plans for that pavilion. They might even use it as a wedding venue to generate more income for the farm's upkeep. As we mentioned earlier, the Gannett Foundation's A Community Thrives initiative is geared toward helping communities grow and prosper. With more on that, here's the chairman and CEO of Gannett, Mike Reed. I'm extremely proud of the Gannett Foundation and our efforts to provide funding to nonprofits across the country. A Community Thrives is an outstanding program that reinforces Gannett's mission to serve and empower communities by helping deserving organizations deliver important services. Supporting organizations that share our purpose is inspiring because we really see people come together through service. We are genuinely working together toward a better future. A Community Thrives also helps these organizations elevate their visibility among potential donors advocates, and volunteers in national and local news outlets. Furthermore, the organizations all participate in the crowd raise portion of the program that more than doubled the Gannett Foundation's investment and magnified the impact of the program for all participants, not just those who receive the grants. They are all doing incredible work to serve the common good and help to strengthen their communities in important ways. I'm excited to see all the good facilitated by these grants. Landing your first job as an adult can be hard. Landing your first job when you're an adult with a disability comes with its own challenges. But with every challenge comes an opportunity, according to the founders of Waggies by Maggie and Friends. When they saw how hard it was for their own children with intellectual disabilities to get a job, they decided to create their own. Special treat for me. The bakers in this kitchen have some very friendly customers with very discerning palates. And it takes the right ingredients to keep these furry clients coming back. I hear that um, you're one of the top bakers. I am. My favorite part of the Waggies is doing two first labels. 
All the staff at Waggies by Maggie and Friends have intellectual disabilities. Marianne Nolan is one of the founders of this organization. She's trying to give adults with disabilities a foothold in the workplace. You have a recipe, you have dough, you have to cut it, get it on a tray. Uh, the trays are the same size, the same number of bones go on a tray every day. And so that consistency blends well with their talents. So as the mixer, I mix the dough, I will prep the, the flour and cornmeal depending on what kind of dough we're doing um, that day. You put the dough through the top of the machine and it'll flatten it out. Marianne witnessed the obstacles her own daughter faced trying to find meaningful employment. Elizabeth has Down syndrome. Marianne wanted to create a space for those who want to work but might need a little extra patience. It's a, a, a community of untapped talent. But um, the challenges that they face are the um, sustainability in a job. And very often they don't have that um, personal attention. Very often they'll lose their job. If there's a behavior that can't be dealt with, they're always kind of the first to go. And um, we just wanted a really good environment and we want to establish something that can be replicated. Unlike other businesses, Marianne says this one isn't meant to grow bigger. Staying small is what ensures every employee has adequate support and the experience to get a job elsewhere in the future. Most of them have gone on to some type of kitchen work. One young man um, worked here. He was uh, responsible for the mixer and cleanup and he's now working at the University of Delaware in the kitchen. She wants to train people to offer similar opportunities in other communities. A $25,000 grant from the Gannett Foundation's A Community Thrives program will help do that. Staff members earn a salary and dozens of others volunteer. Marianne is happy to share the recipe that goes into making the place thrive. We're very simple. I think that that's the, the key, is that uh, we're small, and our growth has to be another us. We can't grow. We, we're not going to have 50 bakers here doing robot work for family, and, and that's the way we want to stay. This family has their product down to a science. Marianne says people started supporting the company because of its purpose, but customers keep coming back to their online store and in person because the treats are a hit. They go off the shelves pretty quickly. What kinds of flavors do you make? Uh, peanut butter, sweet potato, and uh, chicken. And what do the dogs seem to like the best? Peanut butter. The customer is always right, so these cooks are working hard to make sure their fans stay loyal. Waggies by Maggie and Friends will be hiring 12 additional employees at a new facility with the $25,000 grant it received from the Gannett Foundation. And that brings us to the end of our show. We hope these success stories inspire you to make a difference in your own communities. I'm Zuleika Nathu. Thanks for watching. <laughs>